Hello, <laughs> welcome to the fifth presentation in the okay. Totem Heritage Center's History of Northwest Coast Art Speaker Series. We want to start our presentation this evening recognizing that the Totem Heritage Center is located on the traditional lands of the Tantaquan and Sangyaquan people of the Tlingit First Nations. Our goal with this series is to expose students and viewers to the art and culture of the Northwest Coast's First Nations. This series of six virtual presentations focuses on a variety of Northwest Coast art topics with conversations between artists, historians, and educators. If you have missed any of the previous presentations, uh, check out our Catch a Can Museum's YouTube channel. Tonight's presentation will be followed by a Q&A with the Native Art Studies program students who are participating in this Zoom class. Sinkit master artist and carver Israel Shotridge is a member of the Taekwadi clan of the Tantaquan. He has carved many monumental totem poles, house screens, bent wood boxes, masks, carved panels, and other ceremonial objects in traditional Tlingit style, as well as creating contemporary designs in his work in a variety of mediums, including silver, gold, bronze, and glass. Israel's artwork can be seen around the world in public and private art collections, including many museums and cultural centers. He has received many honors during his career, but uh, for Israel, his greatest accomplishments have been the preservation and perpetuation of his culture by restoring and replicating his tribal totems. Emily Moore is Associate Professor of Art History at Colorado State University, where she teaches courses in Native American and American art history. She is also Associate Curator of North American Art at the Gregory Alicar Museum at CSU. Raised in Ketchikan, Emily researches historical and contemporary arts from the Northwest Coast, as well as the inclusion and exclusion of Native arts in American and world art histories. In her book, Proud Raven, Panting Wolf, Carving Alaska's New Deal Totem Parks, Emily shows how Clinkett and Haida leaders were able to channel the New Deal promotion of Native arts as national art into an assertion of their cultural and political rights. Israel, Sue, and Emily, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Israel and Sue will be thank you. <laughs> thank you. Israel and Sue will be starting things off with a welcome song tonight. We keep fading in and out, so I apologize. I don't know why that's happening. Is it happening for you? It's all good. Okay, good. Okay, here we go. This is a Wrangle welcome song because I'm from the Kick Studies from Wrangle, Alaska. Ready? Go. Hawaii. 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 Yeah, uh, yeah, uh. Oh. Now you're gonna, Israel is going to balance this evening by singing a Take Way D song from Ketchikan. 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 This is the love song. Aduskise. Uh, I, I learned a song from my grandmother, uh, um, Alice Harris, and then relearned it from my mother, Esther Shea, in 1982, when they, when the, a pole was being raised in front of the museum. And actually it was a coming out song, but let's go ahead. Okay. It's called Aduskise. Aduskise, Kashan today, just not quite us. Take way the Yatki, Dayu to Tanka, Oho Ayashka, Ahe Ia, Ahe Ia, Ahe Ia, Ahe Ia, Ahe Ia, and then, uh, we'll just do an uh, entrance to it, and that's it. That's a Takeaway D song. Takeaway D is uh, the Tongas people of Ketchikan. Thank you so much. I think, uh, I think Emily Moore is going to uh, start with her presentation. 
Yes, I'll share my screen. And thank you, Israel, for sharing a Te Kwe Di song. I just wanted to start by saying it's been such a pleasure to hear all of these presentations that the Totem Heritage Center has put on. I think one of the silver linings of COVID is that we've been able to share talks um, beyond just where we are. So I can hear Te Kwe Di songs in my Colorado basement. And I, I just wanna commend Marnie and the Totem Heritage Center for all the work to put on this series. Cause for me, it's been such a pleasure to hear all of the talks. And it's a real honor to be here with Israel tonight. So um, my name is Emily Moore. I'm Associate Professor of Art History at Colorado State University. Oops, let me just start at the beginning here. I'm coming to you from Arapaho and Cheyenne lands in Fort Collins, Colorado. But as Marnie mentioned, I had the privilege of growing up in Ketchikan and graduated from K-High in 1997. And in fact, I think I see Elizabeth Rado there, who's one of my fellow graduates. So nice to see you, Elizabeth. Um, I told Israel that when I was 10 years old, I witnessed my first totem pole raising, and that was the Chief Johnson Kajuk pole that Israel had recarved. Um, so I remember walking down to the library parking lot from my house up on Park Avenue. And that was a really pivotal moment for, for me in my childhood to witness that community and the, the power of that art. So again, it's a real privilege for me to be here tonight talking with Israel all those years later. Okay, can you see my, do you just see one slide here now? Uh, well, we can yeah. see them a little well. Okay, good. I, um, when Marnie asked what topic I could share on, I immediately volunteered the CCC Totem Parks. And that's because I think a lot of times in Northwest Coast Native Art History, we talk a lot about the 19th century and maybe contemporary art starting in the 1960s. But that early 20th century period is often neglected um, in this kind of narrative of classical arts and the renaissance of, of Northwest Coast arts, which is problematic and a lot of scholars have questioned those terms. But this early 20th century period was what I was really interested in um, when I was writing a dis dissertation as a grad student. And that's partly because growing up in Ketchikan, I'd seen how important the Saxman Totem Park was, Totem Bite, these were really, um, they were really interesting places and not everyone knows that they originated during the New Deal, during the Great Depression. They were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps or the CCC. So tonight I just wanted to give um, in my kind of 15 minutes, a brief overview of the CCC program and to really focus on one of the lead carvers for the CCC and that was Charles Brown, who as Israel will tell you later, is a relative of his. So we hope to have some good dialogue on some of the carvings there. Um, so just as a brief overview, some of you may know this already, but the CCC carved six totem parks. Um, most of these parks are in Southern Southeast Alaska, and most of them contain 19th century poles that were either restored or replicated from ancestral native villages. You can see here the six totem parks that were built under the purview of the US Forest Service between 1938 and 1942. These were Saxman and Totem Bight near Ketchikan over on Prince of Wales. You have Klawak, Kassan and Heidelberg. Uh, the Wrangell Park on Shakes Island was a CCC project. There were also some poles restored at the Sitka Park, which an earlier governor, um, Governor Brady had established in the early 20th century three totem poles for Juno and one pole restored for Seattle, which we'll actually look at in a minute. So in the course of four years, the CCC restored, replicated or carved a new 121 poles. It's really a phenomenal project. And um, all of this was patronized by the US government, which was really complicated and complex. So, um, one of the questions that I was trying to determine when I was originally researching this was why did the federal government decide to 
fund totem pole carving after decades of outright suppression and even destruction of totem poles by missionaries and government officials. And um, what I learned was that during the inner war period between World War I and World War II, so in this depression era period, there was a real interest in the United States in defining a distinctively American art and indigenous art became the kind of primo, um, the original native art form, the original American art form. So I love this photo because it's the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, big time for art. And in 1941, they had a huge exhibit where the entire museum was dedicated to Indian art of the United States, as you can see from that title. And at the outset of, the, of MoMA, we have this heraldic pole that was carved by John Wallace, who was a CCC carver based in Heidelberg. So this was really, um, I can't emphasize enough how important indigenous art was on a kind of national art scene in this interwar period. And it really convinced the government to spend a lot of money restoring poles in fairly remote islands in Southeast Alaska. The harder question to answer though was why indigenous communities, Klingit and Haida communities agreed to lend their poles to this government program. And um, as you can see in these photos here, there were huge changes um, that poles underwent because of this, as they transferred from ancestral native villages to totem parks. The top photo is from Haukan, Haida, Kaigani Haida village um, in Prince of Wales. And there you can see monumental poles outside of clan houses associated with the particular clans that they, th whose crests they were marking. They were faced the beach, they were at grave sites. And when the CCC removed those poles from those ancestral villages and repaired or replicated them, then they erected them in totem parks like Heidelberg, which you can see in this bottom photo. Now it's on this grid. All of these clan poles were kind of mixed from different villages and different clans. So th these were really radical changes um, that the CCC program proposed for poles. And I was interested in why Klinga and Haida communities agreed to it. Scholars have long argued that um, one of the main reasons Klinkit and Haida people agreed to the CCC program was because it was the depression and they needed jobs. And certainly that's true. I, when I was researching up at Sea Alaska and reading the Walter Soboloff papers for the Alaska Native Brotherhood, there were all kinds of resolutions from the 1930s during the depression um, saying we really need to advocate for um, relief programs to provide jobs and funding for native communities. And something that's important to know is that um, the CCC initially did not allow native enrollees. It was white only until 1937, partly because the Alaska Native Brotherhood, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, an important civil rights organization in the 20th century for um, Klingit and Haida people, they really were the ones who pushed Congress to um, open the CCC to Alaska Natives. So they deserve a lot of credit for that. This was a letter that I found in the National Archives um, from a Kassan resident, uh, Raymond Jones, he's Haida, and he wrote this in 1938. The fishing season has just come to an end. The people of this village have not earned enough to keep them through the coming winter. There is a desperate need for relief this winter. The natives of this village have never called for relief work unless there's a real need for it. We did not ask for a CCC camp last year. I'm just going to skip down. If there's any way that you could help us, we will appreciate it very much. Mr. Leonard Allen of Ketchikan suggested that the totems at Old Kassan be repaired. He believed that the Parks Department would allow the Forest Service through the CCC to do the repairs. This is a good, worthwhile project, and we wish the Indian office would look into this idea. So again, there was this kind of um, this request on behalf of several indigenous communities. Um, we need relief work during the Great Depression. We could restore these poles. Um, this would be a project that we would be interested in. But besides jobs, 
um, I was really interested in another reason that Klingit and Haida people seem to be willing to work with the federal government on restoring their polls. And that's because the CCC program of 1938 to 1932, 1942, excuse me, comes in the middle of a really important movement for land claims, Aboriginal claims to the Tongass National Forest. And I know this is a ton of text here, so I won't go through everything, but this is just a basic timeline kind of um, from 1929 when the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Alaska Native Sisterhood voted at this famous Haines Convention, which is pictured here. They voted to make land claims to the Tongass National Forest their number one priority. And that's 17 million acres of Southeast Alaska that had been set aside, appropriated really by the federal government with no resolution to Klingit and Haida claims to those lands. And so um, in 1935, President Roosevelt signs this jurisdictional act. He's going to allow Klingit and Haida people to sue for compensation for lands to the Tongass National Forest. World War II intervenes, but you have all kinds of testimony where people are documenting their land claims, their histories on the land, their clans, long-standing histories on the land. And guess what? Totem poles were a really important part of documenting those clan histories, right? And for um, Congress to see some of these poles and hear the oral histories that were associated with them. There's actually documentation that some of these poles were evidence that were used in the Clinket and Haida land claims lawsuit. So I find this so exciting because you have to realize that at the same time the CCC men and the Civilian Conservation Corps are working with the U.S. Forest Service to restore poles Many of those CCC men are also in the Alaska Native Brotherhood, and they are contesting the U.S. Forest Service right to those lands. Am I making sense here? I hope I'm making sense. Um, anyway, I I should I need to hurry up. Um, just as a brief overview of some of the steps behind this program, so. The first step was that the Forest Service did a kind of reconnaissance mission on all of these ancestral villages where um, the 19th century totem poles still stood. And as you can see from this photo of Old Kassan, many of the poles were decaying, falling over. Many of them had already been cut down and taken by museums and the Harriman expedition, they'd been stolen from Alaska. So there was this real emphasis to try to preserve what was left in Alaska. So the Forest Service went around um, documenting all of these poles in various ancestral villages. They then had to work with the Office of Indian Affairs, now known as the BIA, but then it was known as the OIA, to identify the contemporary claimants to those poles. And I was so excited to find in the Ketchikan Ranger District office, these historic photos where the Forest Service had gone around taking photos of 19th century poles. And then on the back of the photos, they worked with the OIA to determine who was, who should they talk to about asking permission to restore this pole. And in this case, this pole is labeled Port Tongass, William Brown, who's the father of Charles Brown. We'll talk about more in a second. So once they had identified the poles they wanted to restore or replicate, um, they had to write these memorandum of agreement where they asked native claimants to the polls to sign, um, granting the government the right to restore or replicate these polls. And there's some really difficult changes um, spelled out in these memorandum of agreement um, for one thing, these poles would be preserved that had not been part of the tradition, as I'm sure you all know, poles would have been allowed to fall and if you needed another one, you would commission another pole and have a potlatch to dedicate it. But now they'd be preserved in these totem parks. The parks had to be publicly owned sites and they had to be considered as community property rather than clan property. And that was very controversial and really difficult for a lot of people to accept that kind of transfer. 
So after they'd signed the memorandum of agreement, um, the Forest Service took their CCC crews out to the ancestral villages and cut down these massive 19th century poles. They moved the poles on these kind of, um, I don't know, these tracks that they built and towed them back to the CCC camps where these crews of CCC men were hired to either restore or replicate the pole. If the 19th century pole was too decayed and they couldn't just insert like a new fresh cedar plug to repair it, then they had to replicate it. And um, I love, this is a great photo from the from Ketchikan Museums, pretty famous photo of all of the CCC enrollees just in Saxman. And remember there were different CCC camps um, all over Southern Southeast Alaska. I just wanna highlight this man here. This is Charles Brown, and this is his father, William Brown, who we'll talk about. So these are some photos of um, transferring measurements from the 19th century pole to the new 20th century pole. They tried to use calipers and, and measuring tapes to try to get um, to be as accurate as they could. And once they had either restored or replicated those poles, they had to raise them in these new arrangements of the totem park, right? Which was completely invented. Um, most of these parks were designed by US Forest Service architect, Lynn Forrest, whose family still lives in Juneau. Um, and I found this plan that he originally made for the totem or Saxman Totem Park, it's in the National Archives. And here again, he was mixing poles from Tongass Village, Village Island, Cat Island, and Cape Fox. So mixing Tanta Kwan and Sanya Kwan poles. And he laid them out in this very kind of, um, it's actually like a French garden style monument park. He was trying to create these very stately boulevards um, that would help more non-natives think of poles not as curiosities or grotesques, which is how many people referred to totem poles in the early 20th century. He was trying to make them appear as these kind of dignified monuments. Um, but again, very strange new inventions. Totem bite, as I'm sure you all have been out there with those kind of serpentine pathways that overlook the ocean. This was much more based on an English picturesque model. Um, so imposing all of these kinds of European garden designs on, on poles. The, after the parks were erected, the real hope was to attract tourists to come to them. Um, the CCC really hoped that these short-term jobs of restoring and replicating poles would lead to longer-term economic opportunities for communities like Saxman or Klawak, because if tourists came, maybe they would buy model poles or beaded moccasins. And in fact, I found some of the model poles that are directly carved in reference to the old CCC carvings. This is a Sun Raven totem pole um, that's now at the National Museum of the American Indian, but it was carved sometime in 1942. And you can see the carver even made the little CCC sign, this kind of wooden roundel that was at the bottom of the Sun Raven pole. So giving tourists a kind of small thing they could pack away in their suitcases easily as a memento of these parks. Okay, I just have like five minutes more, so I'll wrap up. So even though this whole program was, you know, it was government sponsored, it meant so many radical changes for the nature of totem poles and their relationships to clans. What I was really interested in was how Klingit and Haida communities continued to use their poles in customary ways. And so this is a photograph also from the Ketchikan Museums. You can see there's a Forest Service newsreel that's filming this because they made a whole kind of government newsreel about the, the project to kind of tout this excellent relationship that the government supposedly had with Klingit and Haida communities. But at the same time, what also is going on here is Henry Denny, and I don't know if any of the students here are descendants of the Denny family, but um, 
talking about the history of his clan pole, the Snech Adi pole from Cape Fox and telling his grandchildren that pole. And many people that I interviewed whose parents had worked for the CCC really remembered this was an opportunity to bring the poles back into their villages after you know, many people had been sent to boarding school, many people had been cut off from relationships to their poles and even their clan histories. And these CCC totem parks, as weird as they were, they also offered the opportunity for this passage of, of knowledge between generations and for people to reconnect with their clan histories. Um, they also allowed documentation of those clan histories on the land. And I love this example because this pole that's in the Klawak Totem Park was actually entered as evidence into that Clinkett and Haida lawsuit that I was talking about. Um, it appeared as evidence for this particular clan's claims to the property, that famous salmon stream at Klawak. And so these totem poles became kind of evidence for clan histories on the land that ultimately helped the Klingit and Haida prove their continuous occupation of the Tongass National Forest. Okay, so this is my last slide that will help transition, I hope, to Charles Brown. Um, Charles Brown was the lead CCC carver in Saxman. He, his mother was Sonia Kwan Nech Adi, his father, who's also in this photograph, William Brown, seen here on the left, he was Tanta Kwan Te Kwedi. And so um, Charles Brown is Tanta Kwan Te Kwedi Yadi. He played a really important role in documenting a lot of the stories for The Wolf and the Raven that you might know, um, which was told so many stories of the poles in Saxman and Totem Bight. And he also really emphasized the importance of oral histories, um, that we know our history on the land. We did not come from Asia on the Bering Sea land bridge. We were made here. And um, we, we basically have this important history on the land. I, I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna go through one last poll. Um, Charles Brown famously brought back this Seattle pole, which had been stolen from Tongass village, his father's village. In 1899, the Harriman expedition had cut down this pole and brought it to Seattle. And um, Charles Brown talked about on this pole up that's out at Totem Bight, the wandering raven pole is what he called it. If you look carefully at the crests, he was really referencing the stories that were on the Seattle pole and bringing them back to Totem Bight. So I, I love his carving. He has such beautiful work, if you've ever studied his work carefully. And he was really important, um, I think an activist who was working both for the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the CCC recarving these poles during a really potent political time. Okay, I'm so sorry, I've taken up a lot of time. So let's go to Israel now. Uh, <laughs> You're on now. Hi. Uh, am I visible? Good, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, want, can't see. I, I can't see. I, I want to say hello to um, wh whoever is watching, uh, especially the students. There we go. Um, hello to you. I graduated from K High in 1970. Uh, grew up in Ketchikan, born in 1951. My grandmother would take my brothers and I to the totem parks in Ketch Park in Ketchikan and tell us um, the stories behind the totems that were Tongas. So, hello to uh, to everyone. Uh, I grew up around the Totem Park in Saxman and, and the Totems in Ketchikan, learned the stories from my grandmother and my mother. They um, wanted to make sure that my brothers and I did not forget um, who, who we are. So, and she also said that to my older brothers, 
brothers and sisters who went to a boarding school in Skagway. She met my, my father in Wrangell. Um, they married, that's where they met, but she married my father who's from a village up north called Klukwan. You probably heard of it, uh, the village. It's near Haines, Alaska. Um, I learned carving from a gentleman that lives in Ketchikan that you probably hear about. Um, he's um, a, a, a master carver that I I got introduced to through carving in Saxon. Uh, Nathan, Nathan Jackson taught me how to carve, taught me how to make tools, adzes and knives that I use with him in Saxon. Um, I didn't know that I was gonna become a carver. Uh, before I met him, I went to a marine engineering school so I could become an engineer for the state of Alaska on the ferry system there. Uh, he and I carved um, several poles together. Uh, I'm not the only one, there were several other people that uh, learn to carve out there as well. One of them is uh, David, Dave Jensen. And um, uh, he and I carved together there. Uh, Nathan would um, show us um, how to rough out totem poles, how to, you know, uh, do fine carving, uh, you know, from roughing them out. Uh, he, um, he would sing songs to us. He would jump up on the totem and say, uh, he would, you know, he would um, say, you're distracting me. He, was, he would say songs, sing songs. He would tell us the song. And when we would carve with him, Dave and I, he would say to us, do you see it? And we would look at one another and say, uh, no, we don't see it. Because we weren't familiar with carving. We knew the stories behind them from, from my grandmother and my mother, but um, carving was totally different to us. We, um, we knew the stories from our grandmother and my, my mother, because in Clinket culture, um, you learn all that from your mother uh, and uh, other relatives in the tribe. So knowing how to carve them was, uh, was important to my mother, not so much my father because he was from Klukwan, um, but from uh, other uh, relatives in the tribe, the Tongass tribe. Somebody is asking a question right now. What your favorite totem is? I can't, I'm not watching. Carved. Oh, right there. What was your favorite totem uh, pole that you carved? It, it's called the uh, Sun Raven pole. Uh, it stands out in front of Saxman, uh, the very first pole you'll see as you enter. You have to tell them. The Saxman Totem Park. He's answering your question. I think it's Ch Chevy. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't um, mention that. What, uh, what was your favorite totem pole that you carved? Well, my favorite totem pole is the Sun Raven pole. Uh, I saw it every day. Uh, um, my grandmother would take 
my brothers and I to the pole and, and tell us the story behind it. And the other totems in, in Saxman that belong to the Tongas tribe. Tell them that what you did with inlay of the common. What you have to say again? Wait, you inlaid the abalone? Oh, this pole I replicated. It's the Sun Raven pole, and it stands out in, in front of the, um, what's the name of that? Robinson building. The Robinson building. It, um, it wasn't called the Robinson building when I was growing up. It was a, um, a pole. I mean, a building that housed the bowling alley. And then later became the Robinson building. That, that pole is a, a, um, is a Tongass pole raised on Pennock Island. And um, so when I became aware that it was a Tongass pole, I wanted to re replicate it once again. And um, I carved it out. In, uh, this one? We had it here. Well, it was here in, on Vashon. Uh, Vashon. I started it in Ketchikan and moved it to Vashon and finished it and then uh, had it shipped up to uh, Ketchikan. A lot of people don't know that this totem pole, Israel carved it on his own. He wasn't paid to do it. It was uh, his preservation efforts to have that pole carved and replicated. So he, he, donated, he donated that to the community and to the tribe. Right. Um, it it may look a little different than the one that's out in Saxman, but that that also is um, a, a a preference carvers will uh, will do. They they um, they well, carvers like to show their expertise in terms of carving uh, a totem pole. So those poles out in Saxon, they may uh, look like the ones that were carved during the uh, Civilian Cons Conservation Corps, but they also add their own uh, style. And um, they, they like, to do that so that they're recognized as the carver. That, what year was that carved? Do you remember? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember the date. Anyway, this is another one that I replicated that uh, Charlie Brown card. Um, the man wearing the bear hat. The man wearing the bear hat. Yep. It was during the winter and it was snowing a little bit uh, out there in uh, Totem Bite. The hat is separate from the pole. It, it took about four people to to carry it out to the to the park where the pole was raised, and then we um, placed it on top of the the man. Charlie Brown carved it. Yeah, but Rachel. I don't know when he carved it. It's a man wearing the bear hat, with a uh, face on the. Uh, uh, on the fin on top. It was fun to do. Uh, of course, this is 
Sue, my wife Sue and I, when we finished the poll of uh, uh, 1989. Yeah, that one. It was it was called it wasn't called you know by the native uh, Tongass tribe. It wasn't called that what it's called. Chief Johnson totem. Hmm? This is the Chief Johnson totem. This is the Chief Johnson totem. Yes. It took a year and a half. And a half. Well, 18 months to carve it. Yeah, right. But it took a year to find the, a tree that would uh, accommodate the Chief Jocelyn, Chief Jocelyn Pohl. Um, uh, Nathan Jackson carves up on top. Nathan Jackson carved the wing, the wing of uh, the projector up on top. Uh, of the <laughs> Nathan carved, um, and then on the very top, he also carved the a wing uh, to the, the 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 bird called the Kajuk. And your brother did too. And my brother Norman as well, Norman Jackson. But that's us when we were uh, finished with it, even after the pole raising and celebration. Up there, Sue, Sue and I. You probably recognize the buildings behind it. Better. But the uh, the fish that uh, that are being held by uh, by the main figure, the raven, and two little faces on each side. Um, you're asked. I didn't um, take much liberty when it came to really actually carving the totem pole. It's it's you you want to, but the elders in Ketchikan, besides my mother, uh, wanted me to live uh, and and keep it as uh, original as I could. You're being asked um, huh. if you have any advice to carvers for carrying on the tradition? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't get much advice. My advice to me was by the elders to live no, up. What do you advise them? That's what I'm doing. Oh. I'm, <laughs> I'm giving carver who, carvers in general, the fact that, you know, that um, they should live up to the, um, the, the, if you're replicating a totem, you should live up to the original totem. It's hard to do, but you should. That's all the advice I can give you to a carver who's going to maybe replicate a totem. And, that, and to keep a, focused on it, right, keep focused. That, yeah. And keep focus. This is a pole that I carved for uh, the U.S. Forest Service. If you're ever in in uh, Washington D.C., you're allowed to look. You know, to go to the U.S. Forest Service building headquarters. Headquarters, and uh, see this to totem. How many feet is it? I think this one was like maybe thirteen feet. Yeah, but 13 feet. Yeah. 13 feet. Yeah. It's got a cute uh, frog on the top. Anyway, we'll start from the <laughs> bottom. Normally, that's what you do. You start from the bottom and work your way up. So at the bottom, there's a, a box with an eagle on the left, a bear in the middle, and the, is that a wolf? Mm -hmm. And a wolf. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a, a carver 
from the Civilian Conservation Corps. He's wearing a uh, um, a vest with pencils. A vest that normally they would wear in the, back in the day, wearing some. Um, what are those? Moccasins. Moccasins. <laughs> and he's also wearing, uh, holding a ads, uh, totally made out of wood, not separate from the pole, still part of the pole. And then his face, then a bear chuckyette. And um, what are those called you, on the top there? The sea urchin, I mean, this um, sea lion. Yeah. So, Whiskers, but, but we didn't use real sea lions. No, we didn't do that. We, um, yeah. I carved it this, separate. This is self portrait. Well, <laughs> I, I suppose you could call it a self portrait of, of the carver. Uh, some um, white um, ermine. Ermine. And then in the middle, there's a, a, a um, the copper, a copper, an eagle holding a copper, a, an eagle holding the copper with the U.S. forest and the emblem. U.S. For, forest emblem, uh, wings for the eagle on top, the eagle, and oh, then a raven. a raven at the very top. At the front. It's carved uh, cedar, western red cedar. That tree came from um, Prince of Wales. We I carved it here on on rank up. Vashon. Vashon, <laughs> and that's where it, the photo was taken on Vashon. We shipped it to Washington D.C., and then it took the U.S. Forest Service about 11, 14 years maybe 11 years. And then they asked us to come to do a ceremony. And that was really fun. We, we brought some of our um, clan members back east to Washington, DC and yeah. met uh, the chief of the Forest Service. Uh, that, that was very um, special to us, you know, for the tribe to um, have a poll of modern day, carved and raised in um, Washington, D.C. So there's a question, Israel. How well do you think modern carvers are keeping the tradition? Yeah, I, I you know, uh, I'm honored that they, that you call, ask that question, because the, the modern day carvers are doing really a good job. Uh, um, there's a gentleman in Sitka. He um, he does real well. What is, what? I'm not sure who you're referring to. Uh, Nick Galanin. Nick Galanin is a real good carver. Um, do you have a hard time finishing a project before starting a new one? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I don't know why that is. I I, I think. I, I want to add because I've been with Israel on most of the totems he's carved, and well, you painted when he, that when pole, he right? gets. I I have personally painted all his poles with help from friends and different people that have helped along the way. But when he gets to the point of carving the totems and he's finished. He's tired of it. He wants somebody <laughs> else to finish it up. That's true. And so we yeah. finish it up by painting it. Are poles carved from red or yellow cedar? Well, I've never seen, I, I, you can see, I, I don't know if you can find one in, in Alaska carved out of yellow cedar. The preferred wood is red cedar, old growth. Western red cedar. All of Israel's totems have been red cedar in the monumental totems, but he has carved yellow. I have, yeah. In smaller model poles. Yeah, big ones, uh, they're not preferred. Emily, you can 
um, flip through some of the photos if you want. And maybe I you want to yeah, sure. tell real quick. Yeah. These two totems were commissioned by the Alaska Native, Med Alaska Native Heritage Center. And the pole on the left is the, represents the Clinkett tribe. The pole on the right was the Eak tribe. And the reason that Israel carved both of them, he was commissioned to carve the Clinkett totem. And the Eak tribe didn't have a designated carver. And we bid on it. And they loved Israel's idea. And so he got the commission to do both of these totems in the house at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. So we spent the summer there uh, carving and painting those poles. He started it here on Vashon. And here's a picture of us working on the Clinkett totem. You have a question, what is the most important part of the totem pole? Well, it, oh. The, uh, well, the most important, I, I think, is the, the, the bottom and then working your way up. But at the top has to be a, a strong uh, image of, you know, of a tribal group. Might be a raven at the very top. And then maybe a strong character, uh, maybe a bear at the bottom. So you have to have, you know, th those working together. You have a question. How do you decide what project to start next? I don't, <laughs> I don't. It just happens. Well. Uh, well, you know, for an artist like myself, uh, it happens and I, um, I. Over the years when Israel was really actively carving monumental totems one after another, it really was based on what he had lined up for projects and commissions. Um, we have a, a, a question here. Is there a traditional reason behind the time capsule? Uh, no, I, you know, I don't have a traditional reason. And I don't know if, if my cousin, my mother's cousin Charlie Brown ever at you know added a um, you know a time castle, but I like doing it, you know. And you know if 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 I do add a time castle on the pole in Washington D.C., I um, dedicated uh, a song to Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> I love Jimi Hendrix. Uh, you know, I, I don't only listen to Jimi Hendrix, you know, so, but I wanted to honor Jimi. And I had a friend in Ketchikan named, uh, oh, what is his name? Um, Dave? Who are you talking about? In Ketchikan? Yeah. Um, Dave Rubin? Dave Rubin, yes. He painted. Uh, honored me by painting a portrait of me. I don't know if it's in Ketchikan any longer. It's at the Discovery Center. At the Discovery Center. So you have a question. Is the history behind the Sun Raven pole in the Wolf and the Raven book that was mentioned earlier or recorded somewhere else? However, I think that maintaining the practice of the oral history is also important. Uh, is it dedicated to? Uh, 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 I'm not sure if I dedicated it to. Uh, I, I, it doesn't say. I, I might have dedicated it, but I don't remember who 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 to. No, I don't think it. Okay. Well. Yeah. Any other questions? Up from anyone? Those are good questions. Thank you. Emily, do you want to, I think there's a few more photos. Do you want to flip through those and we can hear a little bit about that um, from Israel and Sue and and if if you have any questions about those or comments. Yeah, this is a 
this is when we were transporting the KIC Clinket totem, the red cedar from Prince of Wales Island by Linden or AML that brought it over to Ketchikan and then up to the Totem Heritage Center. Yeah, I, uh, you know, um, we, we don't have any that, um, we don't have any photos. We do have photos. These are our photos, honey. Yeah. Oh, well. These are ours. Right. Yeah. Okay, you could go to the next one. Yeah, that's what. And that's I, going into the right. carving shed. Yeah. That was a lot of fun doing. My nephew, Robert Jackson, was uh, helping me, and uh, a uh, gentleman that we adopted, um, Robert Barrett from. from uh, uh, what what island is he from? He lives on Bowen Island. In Bowen Island. Near Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. It was a lot of fun to do. Uh, I mean, I've never done characters that I've done on that pole. Uh, like a, a weaver. Uh, she's there to honor Holly. Churchill? Churchill, yeah. We we um, created, or Israel created, um, weavers, cedar bark weavers, raven's tail weavers on this totem, and mothers and children. So it was a contemporary design. And that that is um, uh, my daughter in the middle with her mother, Sue. And then and Rachel. Marge. And, and then um, Marge. Marge Bird. And her daughter. And her daughter. And your brother. And, and my, my brother right behind Marge, Jim Jackson. Do you have any advice for, us, for an aspiring carver? Yes, I do have a lot of advice for an aspiring carver. Work hard because, you know, if you're going to continue to carve, you got to work hard. Uh, I don't mean that, you know, to say that disrespectfully, I'm saying that respectfully. Do a lot of work, draw a lot, uh, whatever is in your mind, and um, express yourself that way. That, that's all I have. So a lot of people don't get to see Israel's original totems that he has carved that are all over the United States and internationally, but I just selected a couple to show. These are a set of two house post style totems that are in the Seattle area in a private home. And um, these were carved about I'd say 15 years ago, maybe. Right, yeah. Well, well you know, sometimes you, if you see work by another artist that has no paint, well, the people that we, we carve uh, images for, not, not just totems, they pref if they prefer no paint, that that that's fine with myself and my wife. In fact, I like it a lot without paint. Not, not everything. Uh, paddles that I've done, boxes, bentwood boxes that I've created for commission. People don't want paint, and that's fine with me. This is a, uh, uh, that was an image showing the Chief Johnson pole. No, that looks oh. like the bear wear, man wearing the bear oh, hat. Oh, I didn't recognize that. That's what it looks like. Yeah, sorry, that was the end of the slides. And, and this yeah. is actually Charles Brown's right. man in the bear hat. Yeah. yeah. I, I know them very well because I painted them. And so <laughs> I have a really good memory with the tattoos. And 
the coloring. Yep, thank you. Here's another question to Emily. Hmm. Well, I'm a, a thank you for inviting me. There's a question. Charlie Brown has been mentioned several times. Was he a native carver from Ketchikan? Do you recall his plan? Well, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know him. He, he he passed away, you know, before I I became a carver. We've met his family though. They live down in California. We've met several of the family. Yeah, you can um he did um writing for the um what is the name of uh, the college? Oh. Um, I think Emily, you mentioned it. He did some recordings at the University of California, Berkeley when he lived in San Francisco because they brought him over to talk about their Thinget collections. And those recordings are still at Berkeley. You can get them and it's, it gives me chills to hear his voice talking about all of these 19th century pieces that were up in the Hearst Museum at Berkeley. Well, you know, um, my mother's um, cousin uh, who um, did a lot of reco uh, recordings for or at, uh, at the um, University of Pennsylvania in Philly. Have you heard them? Uh, uh, he has a really, he has a really strong uh, uh, clinket, ka, man, voice. So you have a question. Do you have a signature or logo that you sign your work with? I do, but at 70 now, <laughs> I, wow. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm I mostly signed for my, you know, uh, prints that I that uh, we sell at our our shop online. We've had a few questions for Emily as well. Emily, don't be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh huh. Can I ask you a question? Please uh, do. I I'm wondering. Um, uh, the the book that I'm reading now that you wrote, uh, I'm wondering, um, did you have a hard time coming up with an image for the you know for your book on, on the, the for the cover? Yeah, yeah. It was there was a big debate about that. We should we have a kind of 1930s era image from the CCC period and then. Other people thought it should be a color image because it's just prettier. So we went with a, um, it was actually an Adelaide de Menil photo of the Cloac Park. That's, I think, really pretty. <laughs> I, I, I like it. I was just wondering, you know, um, how, how you chose an image for it. So you have a question, are you still carving? No, I'm not. I'm not carving anymore. Uh, it, it, yeah. I have arthritis. I've had arthritis since I moved to Vashon. And um, it uh, is now uh, affecting my hands. When I did get arthritis, I... Um, I uh, I don't know what you call it. Um, it was in remission. I, I went into remission and that lasted a long time. So now it's reawoken and my hands are, you know, probably um, the, the one thing that affects me most. Uh, I have um, uh, a, a bout that I've had for quite a while four years maybe, uh, called, um, what do they call it? The sciatica? It's the term that it's, that it's called. It's called sciatica. So Israel threatens that he's gonna carve again. 
Well, I don't say that it's over, but I'd say yeah. that he's taken a good long break. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I still draw and um, I'm doing images for a whole new set of images for, for our- Prints. Prints, business, yeah. So you'll, you'll see them eventually one day. And the students can see um, other photos of Israel's work online at shotridge.com. If they'd like to see some, there's a page on Israel on the e-commerce that you can see a cross section of his totems and other pieces. You know, we definitely see Israel's work um, like prints and such things at, at Crazy Wolf Studio and other uh, spaces in, in Ketchikan, so. Yeah. Our business, the Shot Ridge Collection, which is the reproductions of Israel's designs. We're in our 32nd year. Can't believe it. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> another unbelievable, believable thing. 32 years we've been yeah. marketing the Shot Ridge Collection and Maybe some of you remember it when we had all kinds of different products that we no longer carry and we've changed it along the way, but um, it's, it's keeping me very busy. And we are recruiting. So if there are any native students that wanna come down this way to work for the Shot Ridge Company, you're welcome. Good so, to know. Um, yeah. We we're gonna wrap up shortly, but we have a few questions uh, that I wanted to make sure we, we got answered if possible. Um, to Emily, what were your most useful or dependable resources when researching for your book, your dissertation? Yeah, actually, oh, am I unmuted? Yes, you can hear me. Um, actually, this started at the Totem Heritage Center. I was a docent there in college and um, I don't know if any of you remember Chris Hansen when he was a curator there. He handed me a CD that had just hundreds of photocopies on it from the National Archives, and it was all of the U.S. Forest Service correspondence about the CCC program. And I remember putting that CD in my CD drive at home and like just starting to read like this world just kind of ballooned in front of me where I realized, oh my gosh, there's all of this records, at least from the Forest Service point of view, as to how that program unfurled all of the kind of um, complications, whether it was funding or trying to find native paints, which they ultimately couldn't do because they couldn't chew enough fish eggs to make the fish egg binder for all the pigments. So they ended up using commercial paints. So that was fascinating. Um, and then what I started doing was just, I spent a year um, coming back from grad school and spending in, in Southeast Alaska, just going around to different communities. Claude Miju Morrison was still alive at the time. I don't know if some of you know Miju in, in Heidelberg and he had actually carved for the CCC. To my knowledge, he was the last living CCC carver. So I felt really privileged to be able to spend time with him. And he was the one who really told me kind of about using calipers to transfer measurements and just how the process went when he was this 20 year old kid who really hadn't had any training as a carver. I saw someone's question earlier in the chat was how did the CCC choose carvers? And that's a great question because as you probably know, a lot of that generation hadn't had the opportunity to carve. They didn't know form line. They had been sent to boarding school and had really been discouraged from practicing any of those um, traditions. So John Wallace, who was a carver in Heidelberg and who became the leader of the CCC camp in Heidelberg, Thomas Yukas in Wrangell, um, William Brown and Saxman, who passed on a lot of his knowledge to Charles Brown. There are these few carvers who had been trained in the 19th century who did their best to um, teach this younger generation in the CCC carving sheds. 
And I think for a long time, our historians kind of made fun of the CCC work, like it wasn't very good, it wasn't as good as the 19th century polls. And then certainly there's some truth to that. A lot of those carvers just hadn't had the years of practice that many of their 19th century counterparts had had. But I think when you really think about what they managed to do in a work relief program where many of them were reconnecting with 19th century polls and clan histories that they hadn't been taught, it's really amazing what they did. And they became this really important link between um, the 19th century and this kind of these later generations that had more opportunities to carve. So, so to answer the question about sources, it was really those National Archives sources for the Forest Service side and then interviewing um, either CCC carvers or very few who were still alive or their descendants who remembered their parents and grandparents working for those parks. Emily, we had another question from a student uh, saying that she'd read many of Catherine Kuh's correspondence in the beginning stages of developing CCC, where the or original intended location for the Totem Park was uh, where the current ballpark is in Ketchikan prior to deciding on Saxman. Uh, do you know if the location change related to, you know, Ketchikan City Council rebutting the native land claims at the time, or uh, she says so far as the deeds contested in federal court? Yeah, that's so great. You've read Catherine Koo. She hated the CCC, and she wrote nasty stuff about them, mostly because she was really worried, um, and this did happen, the CCC would burn some of the 19th century poles for firewood sometimes to keep, to heat their carving sheds. Well, I um, forgive her. <laughs> what's that? I forgive her. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I, I can understand, I certainly can understand. Uh, well, you know, um, we didn't have very many people to, um, to look to even when I was growing up. So, you know, I, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't have any, um, any uh, feelings like her. Um, I mean, after all, I had my father and my mother. So, you know, to, um, to ask questions to, and they, they would tell, tell me anyway, you know, even if I wasn't old enough to, I was just a kid. But later, I was able to rely on their their information and what they told me about my tribe, my tribe, and my father's. Uh, my mother's mother had uh, my father had a, a cousin named. Um, um, now I'm trying to have a hard time remembering what um, my father's cousin. Which one? <laughs> Which one? Anyway, I had a lot of I had a lot of advice from my father and my mother, and and when they told me my history, that was important for me to know. Everyone should know that. That I'm not saying you don't have to have you have to know it, but if you do, as you know, and you're a carver, that's important because you can rely on it and you can draw from it your memory. Uh, it's important to know so you can share through drawings and your work. That's important to do is to share. I'm, I mean, I, I have a nephews who learn from that, uh, and I, I have granddaughters who are only three and eight now, and I'm teaching them my tribal songs. You know, because they're they're those songs are their mother's songs. The house that I live in, I have many images that I that. Uh, they see drawn and painted by their their grandfather, so that's important. 
<laughs> that they're able to um, learn from. I'm, I'm, I don't tell them I did this and did that. If they ask, that's what I, I, will, I will tell them about my experience with Nathan Jackson in Saxman and Catch Cash. Uh, I'm drawing all the time. I'm still drawing. So that's important that you do that, you know, draw and um, <laughs> you have any plans for your carving tools now that you're been uh, forced to retire from carving due to health? Uh, he's not totally retired. He's not. I'm not. <laughs> he says that. I I do, I do, I do that, and I you know, I'll just share you one thing that I'm doing now. I'm not doing now, but I I I'm doing. Don't move your. While Israel has stepped away, uh, for any of you students, does anybody else have questions? Yeah, here we are. Go in and out. It kind of goes in and out with the computer. Oh, animal. cool. That is a model canoe that he's carving that represents the Rangul clan, Shakwan, Kiksadi. There, you know, well. The, <laughs> well, we'll yeah. put it on our website. Oh, perfect. That would we'll be do that. I think um I think if you just get out of but, that. Uh, uh, thank you for watching. And uh, thank you to Marty. I think we've uh I didn't hear anything from any more of the students, so I think we're we're good on the questions. Well, I, I hope I answered enough questions for you. And students are all welcome to email us if yeah. you have questions. You are welcome. Well, yeah, thank uh, you all so much. Israel, Sue, Emily, thank you very much for, for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. We're honored to have you here speaking with us tonight. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have one last uh, presentation coming up for the History of Northwest Coast Art Speaker Series. We will wrap up the uh, series on Wednesday, April 6th with Evelyn Vanderhoop and Carrie Ann Vanderhoop. So definitely uh, tune in then uh, to hear about uh, weaving and textiles and uh, yeah, the effect. It'll be a great conversation. So thank I only, you. I only grew up a house away from her. Oh, really? It'll, yeah, they'll, they'll be great. So we hope to see you all back then. Israel, Sue, Emily, thank you again. And everybody have a very good night. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Good to see you. Thank you all. Thank good you. Finish. Thank you.